you know, was my relationship with family members, and I saw, for example, with certain family members, the relationship cools over time. Not only does the volume decrease, but the sentimentality of the, of the email decreases. <coughs> and then for other people, it picks up, right? And particularly, let's say, if, um, you know, it's a new budding friendship or relationship, usually it starts like this, and then it just explodes, right, in terms of number and sentiment. So you can learn these really cool things about your history. Um, okay, so th this is going to look like it's going to look like a lot of um, a lot maybe, but we'll we'll try to stick through just what the important parts of it are. Um, so don't worry about any of this library stuff for now. Really, what I want to take you through here is um, can I, is there a way I can mirror it here? Can you increase the size of the letters? Can I what? Increase the size. Uh, well, I might be able to. Let me see. Do you know how to do it in Sublime, Tuka? How do I zoom in? Project view. Layout, groups, syntax. That's it. Call it out if anybody sees it. Is there, is the full screen supposed to be bigger? But I don't Okay, so so and, and you know you don't need to worry about taking notes or any of those things. We're gonna share a version of this with you guys, right? And you can you can just dig through it. But here's the things I want to um, sort of you know kind of the thing I want to kind of download to you is this is the lib, yeah. Okay, so it's really simple, right? Obviously, the first thing you have to do is downloading the email, and actually, believe it or not, if that's the most painful part of the whole thing. <laughs> Once you have the data out of the email servers, it's significantly easier to play with it, right? So the most painful part is this, and remember I said, oh, there's this thing called IMAP. So depending on your, what kind of email server you have, you might have to change this. So you, you might have to dig through, go to Google, say, what is Yahoo's, you know, SMTP server. And you'll have something like this. Instead of being imap.gmail.com, maybe it's imap.yahoo.com. Maybe if for your school address, there's some equivalent of this. So what you have to do is, if you're not using Gmail, you'll have to change that. Similarly, they're going to have a number here. In Gmail's case, it's 993. You have to, whatever it is for your thing, they will report it somewhere, right? If you just Google around, you'll find it. Okay. Um, this you don't need to worry about. This just says call when you run the script uh, a prompt so that the person puts in their email address and their password. And this says which mailbox to look in. Depending on the mail server you're using, you also might need to change. This is why we put this stuff towards the top. Because right? these are things that you might need to change. Okay, so this search list says you probably don't want to download your entire IMAP mailbox. You're going to want to download a piece of it, right? Maybe the last, everything since the 1st of March, 2018. So this allows you to alter that, okay? After you've done that, um, I'm not gonna go through this because the version we're gonna give you is gonna be clean, so you won't <coughs> look at any of this, it'll be a function. Um, when you run that download mail, after you've specified these parameters, just all the way up to the search list, you're done. It's gonna run into your mailbox, it's gonna grab all the mail, and it's gonna save it into a file for you, okay? right on your uh, Python pickle file, is what they call it. Um, and then the plotting Im imports that data file that has been generated, and it, it just, it, you know, this will, I've, we've tried to comment it very well, so I'm not going to take you through this one in detail, but it, it runs through and it basically just colors the nodes, you know, make, puts values between the lines, so on and so forth. So the real thing I wanted to point out in this script for you is that Major things, that if you're going to have to change anything, it's going to be here at the top. And everything else you can probably just run right in the box. Okay? That's, that's really what I wanted to show you. Okay. Great. So, I don't know how much time we have left. 
Okay, so how much time do we have? What time? Five to seven. We read after this room, five to seven. Five to seven. Okay, so we have time. Okay, so what, what we had planned for was to have a, uh, a one hour and 15 minute session, which is what we accomplished, and then to open it up for questions or to do activities together. So maybe we can start by asking, I don't know if you guys have questions. You know, we can go through some of those. Yeah. Go ahead. Just oh, jump. I, I have a question. It's more about the, uh, the wearable research that we're doing. Yes. Uh, the voice detection. Um, a lot of times, or I, I've been hearing a little bit recently about ways to kind of like hack the neural network model in which you have a predefined kind of a data set that you plug into it and it gives the opposite result that it's kind of given for everything else. So like an example would be like image detection or facial recognition yes. and you draw like a square on your forehead and suddenly it does you in, and it, yeah. when in reality it was trained not to, and it was very good at that before you put a dot on your forehead, but yeah. now yes. <laughs> now Well works. said. If you're going to, so, so let me be very clear. So have you, have, I, I guess, I've, have you tried this yet? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, so actually, remember Tuka had reported, let me come back up here, this is, that's a very good question, thank you for asking. And that shows that, I'm, I'm happy that you know this, right, because the naive user of a neural network which is me. <laughs> what? No, no, I mean, you're kind of clearly not. not. The naive user, the, the reason that they get bitten is because when they're evaluating their networks, they, here's what they do. They take the data, they train it, they train it one time on, nine, let's say, eight of <coughs> data, they test it on this 20. And they say, oh, done, it worked. Mm -hmm. This one I trained, I tested here, it worked. Okay? The problem is, though, that as you're tuning these things for a very long time, you can start to get these models that basically, because you can bend that line so many times, it gets perfect to just for a, a, only what it saw in the training set. Only for exactly your audio, or exactly my audio, or exactly Tuka's audio, it generates the outright outcome. And for everybody else, it just fails miserably. Right? So what you do is you will take, let's say, 90% of the people in here, you test it on 10. Then you take, grab another 90%, you test on another 10. And you keep doing this process, right? to try to get a confidence interval on, okay, really, how well does this work? And that's what this number here was, the plus or minus, uh, actually, that's not for the neural net, that was for the logistic regression, let's go to the neural net. So for the, in the neural net's case, it was plus or minus 9%, so 10%. So that's, that's the thing, right? So depending on, if you got a new person, you could do, you know, you might only get it right 40% of the time, that emotion on the segment level. But the, the advantage to show here is that even though these neural networks are fancy and they look good and everybody talks about them as being hot, oftentimes, frankly, you can do pretty well with those logistic regression models. Logistic regression. And they're easier for you to understand, particularly if you're new to this stuff. I strongly encourage you not to jump into the deep end of the, you know, the neural network pool, right? It's very easy to like, make mistakes. And the performance gains you're going to get for many problems is a couple percent, a couple percent, right? For this chance of completely ruining your algorithms. For those of you that want to do this machine learning stuff in Python, every single one of these things here is one line in Python, just one line. You just have to import scikit-learn. I can show you what the thing is. The really hard part, and don't let you know people, including you know us in the machine learning community, ever fool you. The application of the model is not hard. Setting up the data and the problem is the hard part. That's really where it gets tough, right? If you mess up there, the whole thing goes to hell in a handbasket. So there's, if you have, want to do machine learning in Python, it's scikit-learn. I think it's, yeah, this dot work will take us there. And yeah, so you can come to scikit-learn, and you can see here they've got classification, they've got regression, they've got clustering, they've got model selection, right? A lot of the things that you heard earlier, and these are, single line things that you can take your data, you pass it in, it passes out the consequence that you're interested in. So that's the place you should start if you want to you know, uh, go about doing it. But you will find out that if, if you can collect a good data set, this stuff relatively is actually quite trivial. Right? The tough part's always the data. And the other interesting thing about neural networks, I don't know if you know this, but for example, Google's machine translation, um, it's all done through neural networks, but the Google search engine, they will not touch that. 
those things because they're like, well, I don't know why PageRank or our algorithm ranked this URL above that. We need to know why. And your networks don't allow us to do that. And so they will not even. Mm -hmm. The problem with systems where you can't inspect them is they can very easily be gamed. The box you mentioned, the box mm -hmm. on the forehead. See, if I figured that out, but let's say there was a financial consequence. So in Google's case, if I can reverse engineer their algorithm, what can I do? Well, I show up at the top of Google. Anything I publish which pops right to the top. You can hack it, right? So the problem with creating algorithms that you can't inspect easily is precisely that. There may be a, a way to hack them, like the box on the forehead that you spoke about, that you won't know until some hacker figures it out. Happens, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. So I was just wondering, um, uh, I know how Python has the capability of coming with all these different modules and scikit learner like pandas and all these things. Is that the reason why you wrote it in Python? Because they just come with these kind of open source uh, neural network type uh, tools? Um, and if you would, would you preferably do it in another language that'd be maybe quicker than Python? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, so the, the the reason that we've I I used to be a MATLAB user. I don't know if anybody else in the room is using. Have people used MATLAB? Okay, everybody's nodding. Yeah. So I actually I grew up my whole uh, academic life basically minus six months using MATLAB, and I migrated away very recently because. I wanted to be able to take the software I wrote, like what I'm going to share with you all, and make it free. I didn't want you to have to pay for a MATLAB license to use it. And the nice thing about Python is that assuming the person who wrote the code was responsible, it should be very easy to open it up and run it. Now, if you have a sloppy guy who releases the code, then it's impossible, right, to reproduce anything to do. But, but when done right, you know, you can get as much power as you would in a a MATLAB, or for, oh, by the way, for those of you who use Python, do you use an IDE with it? You guys know what IDEs are? The only one person is raising their hand. Okay, because everybody shook their head yes with MATLAB, let me just give you this is a very important hint for development in Python. If you use MATLAB and you want to use Python the same way you're using MATLAB, this is what you should do. You should install this toolkit, Spider. Um, oops, this is. No, sorry. Oh, sorry, it's okay. If you get a virus, it's yeah. not. It's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny how somebody started a company with the same name as, as this. When this is, I think, probably the more well-known thing. Or maybe I'm just such a geek. I think it's the more well-known thing. Um, okay. So yeah, there's this thing called Spider, and basically the user interface looks identical to MATLAB. I mean, it's identical. You can highlight. You can run the line. You have the variables show up in the top right panel, like the whole shebang. So if you're interested in transitioning away from it, this will help you get into Python and you'll learn it really fast as a consequence. Do you have any transitions between like R and Python? I've never, I have exposure to R, but not so much Python. I'm not sure how similar or different they are, but. Um, I mean, I think the nice, so, so here's the thing. If any of you want to get into web development at any point in your life, Learning Python is going to pay dividends. There's a package called Flask, okay, where, you know, let me look, all, what, a web, what a website is, is it's two things. It's a front end, so it's a pretty piece of HTML, and then it's a back end, which people submit things through HTML forms, you do some magic, and then you return some more HTML back. That's all a website is, right? So that back end component, you can write the whole thing in Python. I don't know if you can do it in R. Maybe you can't. But Python basically can wear so many hats, that that's why you know, I try to transition to it. There's a service that runs it at MIT, actually, which I alluded to, this one, um, connected.mit.edu, which is it's just a, like, it's a, you know, you meet someone over a free lunch, right? Something that you can have. Um, and we have the schools paying for it, which is nice. But we wrote the whole thing, the matching algorithm, all of the you know, dynamic HTML, everything was done in Flask Python. So, you know, it's, it's a really, really nice framework. Um, and we can provide some examples. If, if any of you want to get into web dev, we can post some examples of that, too. Yeah. Are there other questions? 
Yeah, I was just curious to know, uh, just going back to the, I, I stay like kind of curious of this equation. Who assigns the first one on the way and on the... This? Uh, yeah, so the equation here, who assigns the one? So I, I, I know that you, you, just, you said... Ah, great question. The person telling the, telling the story assigns it. That's what the truth is. So if, if, you, if you and I sit down and you're telling me a story, you're going to tell me whether it's a happy or sad story. So I can train the model. Because I'm trying to figure out what your assessment of the story is, not mine. Right? Otherwise, what we could do is we could just go download a bunch of YouTube videos with stories and we could say, oh, well, why collect any data? We don't need data. We can just download YouTube stories and we'll do it that way. But then the problem is if you have 100 people in this room, 100 people have 100 opinions on whether it's a sad story, whether it's a happy story, that's the problem we're trying to avoid. So the person has to themselves report whether the story is a 1 or a 0. You get it? Yeah. Thank you. You're When you have your data, you you always use like the pure data, or do you do some kind of principal component analysis? Or um, okay, so the short answer is it depends, right? In the case of logistic regression models, at the common pre-processing step, something called z-scoring. Does 